Welcome, Jennifer Benzel. I'm so excited to have you here. This is just delightful to have a chance to talk with you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe we can just start by uh, tell us a little bit about how you became an expert on bisexuality, because I do consider you an expert on bisexuality. I know you kind of bolted at me calling you that, um, but you are. And so how did you get there and what are some of the things you've done related to bisexual advocacy? If, if you want to tell us, you can start with what you're doing now and go backwards or go the other direction, whatever works for you. But yeah, tell us about you. Sure. Well, I am bisexual, so there is that piece of things um, that's worth knowing. And I, I came to this sort of in an accidental way, which seems to happen, I think, sometimes with, with our research in the world of psychology and social sciences. But I am a licensed psychologist and I'm a certified sex therapist. So I work with people in relationships, individuals that are having all sorts of sexual health concerns, um, which may or may not include sexual identity exploration, um, gender exploration. And when I was doing my postdoctoral fellowship way back in, gosh, 2014, I began working with a lot more couples who were in mixed orientation relationships, um, didn't really have the language for that at the time. Um, and so I would see folks who came to me knowing that I was an out bisexual therapist and sexual health therapist and gender health therapist. And so they would come to me for therapy, couples therapy, relationship therapy. And what I was discovering is that there were these sort of mixed orientation relationships happening where one partner was in the bi plus community and the other partner was something else, heterosexual, lesbian identified, whatever. And that that was actually becoming a point of um, a topic that came up in the therapy room that was needing to be discussed, different points of view related to sexual identity and the minority stressors that were specific to that. And so like a good scientist practitioner that I am, I went to the research literature and found there is nothing, there is nothing on this um, at the time. And what did exist, as I'm, I know that you are aware of, is the work on what are known as moms or mixed orientation marriages. And so moms research um, started in the late 80s, early 90s, and was really specifically focused on a straight looking marriage where one person was heterosexual and the other person came out um, sometime during the marriage as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Um, and these were the very specific parameters of what a mixed orientation marriage was. Mm -hmm. And it was very much treated in the late 80s and early 90s as a crisis and a, a marital trauma. Um, and so these couples would show up to couples therapists and relationship therapist offices trying to heal this trauma of this breach of trust, right? in the relationship. And so I'm reading all of this. Um, it's useful, it's useful, but it's not what I'm seeing in my office with these mixed orientation couples that I'm working with, particularly within the bi plus community. And so again, being the good scientist practitioner that I am, I was like, we should do some research on these couples. And since that point over the last 10 years or so, well, probably not quite that long, I've really been kind of working to get this concept into both the literature and the clinical world of mixed orientation relationships, right? With a much broader definition where you don't necessarily need to be married, first of all. And it really is a relationship in which two people's sexual orientations just, they don't match, right? So one person doesn't have to be straight. It doesn't have to be sort of the straight sexual minority partnership. It's just relationships in which sexual orientations do not match for some, in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, so helpful. I'm going to ask you lots more about all of this and as, as we're talking, but I have to say, you know, it's, it's great how you came to this through your work as a therapist and really recognizing some of these gaps because, you know, we want to be evidence-based and we want to be guided by that. Um, and you really have taken that to heart, not only in terms of finding the information to guide your own practice, but also in terms of saying, I, I wanna generate more knowledge and I want to share it more widely so that other people can benefit from it. So thank you for doing that. I mean, that's, so, that, that, that's, that's such a great model of who, uh, who we should be as professionals. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, and research is often me search, right? And so part of this work was also recognizing that I have been in a number of mixed orientation relationships in my life. And I don't know that I necessarily would have identified that as a point of 
certainly not a problem, um, maybe a point of interest in my own past relationships, but mm -hmm. it certainly was coming up in my therapy office. And I was like, how do, how do I best help these folks? I don't, the literature has nothing to tell me here. Mm -hmm. So why don't we learn from the lived experiences of bi plus folks that are actually in these relationships? Yeah. So if, if what that old sort of trauma around it literature was, uh, wasn't fitting what you were seeing, can you tell us a little bit more about like insights that you have about bisexual people and relationships? Yeah, and so some of what was coming up both in my therapy office and then the subsequent research and focus groups that I was doing with bi plus folks in mixed orientation relationships is that there was a subset of them who they had had that conversation at the very beginning of their relationship. So they went in kind of fully knowing each partner that, hey, we do have different sexual identities or sexual orientations. Um, and that that had kind of always been a part of the conversation in their relationship. Um, so that was true for some of the folks that I interviewed, some of the folks that I did focus groups with. For others, they were more into in this other pattern of I have come to discover this about myself perhaps, and now I need to come out in my relationship. How do I do this? How do I make sure that it goes well? Um, so it, it sort of looked like both of those things. Um, mm -hmm. But importantly, I think trending toward, especially with younger generations coming out earlier, trending towards partners already know this about themselves going into a relationship. And sometimes that's an issue and sometimes it's not, right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. And it's great to see how then things are shifting and maybe it, it's easier, you know, it will be easier for younger folks. Uh, so that's great. And and what are the things as people were, um, so, so I'll tell you about this activity that we did in my class. There's this assignment that I give of, um, assume that you are bisexual and no matter what your sexual orientation, assume you're in a relationship, no matter what your relationship status and write a letter to your partner telling them that you're bisexual because there's readings about bisexuality and relationships and you know share information from these readings. So, so it's an assignment to integrate some knowledge, but it's also can be perspective taking, you know, if people aren't bisexual, or it can be perspective taking also for people to think about how the partner would respond, you know, and, and those things. So they have to write about sort of insights that they've gotten. So, so my students are very interested in this whole thing about disclosure and, and how do people do that? And, but also how do partners respond to that? So I wonder if you can share, you know, anything that you know about that. Yeah, certainly we don't have systematic data on this, which is a shame really, but you know, what I have heard both from therapy clients and patients that I've worked with and research participants that I've worked with is that it really kind of depends on the knowledge of the partner in terms of LGBTQ plus um, awareness, cultural humility, all of those factors. Um, and some personality factors and communication skills. You know, one thing that mm -hmm. came up over and over and over again in, in the focus groups that I did with bi plus folks in mixed orientation relationships is them saying to me, this is about having good, effective, and healthy communication skills. That doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're in a mixed orientation relationship or not. That should be every relationship, right? So these are like mm -hmm. broader hashtag relationship goals. So that had nothing to do with the mixed orientation piece, but you know, what we were hearing from them, my, my research team and I were that it really could go both ways, right? So some folks, their partners were saying, great, fine, it doesn't matter to me, it's about us and I don't particularly care how you identify, not in a dismissive sense, but that it, it's not a deal breaker, right? Others very much kind of fed into these very old school kind of bisexual stereotypes, right? Does this mean you're gonna cheat on me, right? Or for many of the cisgender bisexual women, sort of this assumption of like performative threesomes and um, very much fetish, fetishization, woo, I can say that word, um, about their sexuality, right? And so mm -hmm. I heard from a lot of, particularly the bisexual cis women of, Yep, if I was dating a straight cis guy, there was sort of this assumption of, oh, that means threesomes for me. Yeah, we love bi women, right? So it felt really icky and um, very tokenized in that way. And so it, it really could go both directions. Um, you know, one of the things that I was most interested about in doing that research is thinking about how the nuances of bi erasure, right? And so we often sort of do this automatic um, assumption of people's sexual orientation based on perceived partner gender, right? And so 
there has been some really interesting research, Christina Dyer, Brian Feinstein's work around partner gender and bisexual people. Um, and so I wanted to take that a step further and, and look at, did the sexual orientation of the partner matter? And it seems to be that it does. And so there seems to be something going on with both of these facets of partner identity, both gender and partner sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And what we suspect is going on there is that for partners who are also members of a sexually marginalized community, so a gay partner, a lesbian partner, a queer partner, that there is some recognition and acknowledgement of general sexual minority stressors. Um, and so mixed orientation relationships with folks from two folks or more partners, both from marginalized sexual communities, there seems to be that understanding there. But the microaggressions, the bi erasure can happen in different ways, right? So looking mm -hmm. at bisexuality as a way station to coming out as gay or lesbian, right? So that old trope and stereotype versus for bi plus folks that were in mixed orientation marriages with heterosexual folks that the erasure felt very different, right? The stereotypes that were much more likely to come up there were around the hypersexuality, the promiscuity, right? Um, so the bi erasure and the stereotypes were happening in different ways, it seemed, depending on the gender slash sexual orientation of the partner. Mm -hmm. And I, I want, so that's really, that that makes a lot of sense. And it's really helpful for you to sort of articulate those, those kinds of differences. It, are there, are there things that you notice in terms of bisexual women in relationships versus bisexual men in relationships or versus um, trans uh, bisexual people? I, I tell you what, Tanya, we had a really hard time recruiting bisexual men to do this research. And so mm. that I would say remains a limitation of my own work, a limitation I think more broadly of the work out there on bisexuality. We're starting mm -hmm. to see a lot more of that work and thinking of Wendy Bostwick's work out of uh, University of Chicago. So some really awesome work around bisexual men and bisexual gender diverse folks. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't a posh population that we were able to really get in with very easily. Mm -hmm. I think we had maybe five or six bi-identified men in our, our set of focus groups. So. Yeah, yeah, and and it's you know we have big gaps in the literature, so it's good to identify those gaps. I you know I say to my students sometimes like we don't know anything about this. Go find out. Like yeah, like, take, do we'll research. Do <laughs> there's so much yeah. needed. There's so much work to be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The um, the question that I was that I was coming up with um, around some of this was uh, looking at the literature on not just bisexual people in relationships, but just the literature on mixed gender versus same gender relationships. And, and there are some differences. There's tons of similarities, but there's also some differences. And one of the things that I've been curious about is when bisexual people, like there's some strengths of same gender relationships, like around a get more egalitarian sharing of, of the work around positive communication. And I've been wondering like, Bisexual people could be in both. And if they're in a same gender relationship and then in a mixed gender relationship, do they bring some of those dynamics, some of those positive things from same gender relationships into mixed gender relationships? Like, is that, you know, or vice versa? So I don't think we know anything about that. I haven't seen anything, but I'm I think curious. It's a empirical question, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. That's an empirical question. And I also, you know, I always want us to be very cautious about that framework of mixed gender and same gender because it doesn't always allow for the spectrum of gender, right? And the mm -hmm. diversity of gender mm -hmm. that exists. And so that is also an aspect of bi plus relationships that has really just a huge gaping hole in our knowledge, right? Where yeah. do gender diverse folks fit into this puzzle, right? Because we absolutely know they're there. In fact, we know that trans and gender diverse folks are more likely to identify as bi plus in some way, mm -hmm. um, statistically yeah. speaking. And so that is, you know, an intersectionality piece that is has not been well developed in the existing literature. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, I'm also interested in you're a certified sex therapist. And I, I know that some of my students have like expressed an interest in like, oh, this is an in like, what's that like as a career path? So I don't know if you can just share a little bit about that, like, you know, um, separate from the bisexuality or integrated with it. Um, if you can yeah. share a little bit about sort of how did you, how did you do that? What was the path to get there? Any insights you have about that as a career path? 
Yeah, I, you know, I get this question a lot from students that are kind of coming up through training and through the pipeline. And I think that my story is similar to many other sex therapists and that there's no single path in how to do this. And we've all, many of us at least have kind of piecemeal put our training experiences together and sort of figured it out as we go. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want that to be just front and center that there is not necessarily a right or a wrong way to do this. Um, ASEX certification, which is, um, kind of the gold standard certification for sex therapists, there is um, on their website, asec.org, a very clear set of guidelines of how to become certified. But in terms of, you know, which field you can do this as a social worker, a psychologist, a master's level counselor, you know, there's many ways to become a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. For me, this interest really started, so my work in sexual health, my interest in sex therapy started before the LGBTQ health piece that kind of came in by accident a little bit, like much of my career, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I went to graduate school and folks sort of knew, oh, you're you're like the sex person. So we're gonna send you all the PRAC clients and stuff that have sexual health concerns that sort of became this umbrella of, oh, well, this person's questioning their gender. This person has come out as gay and they're facing family rejection. Send them to Jennifer because she's the sex person. I was like, oh. Mm -hmm yeah, I guess I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't really conceptualized it in that way, but they are two related, but distinct fields, right? LGBTQ health mm -hmm. work clinically and therapeutically and research wise is related, but different than general sexual health and functioning, mm -hmm. um, kind of traditional bread and butter sex therapy work. And I'm really blessed to be able to kind of meet in the middle and have really had just a really privileged career around doing sexual health work with LGBTQ communities, which is so fun and it's definitely never a boring career, so. Absolutely, and I think that your the way your expertise comes together is so beneficial because, uh, because you're able to address that diversity of people's experience as you're doing sex therapy also, um, which not everyone who's trained in sex therapy has that framework is my impression. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and certainly I have a huge amount of heterosexual cisgender folks on my caseload in my practice, and that's mm -hmm. wonderful too. Um, yeah. It has always just been interesting to me how others kind of view that as kind of lumping together. And so early on in my training, I was I was working with LGBTQ plus folks around sexual health concerns, and it was hard to find supervision for that because, mm -hmm. you know, folks didn't necessarily have the expertise to supervise me in that specific constellation of concerns. Right. Um, I think that that's probably improved over the years, but I suspect that your students might run into that depending on where in the country mm -hmm. they are and where they're training. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Thanks for sharing a little bit about that path. So back to bisexuality, um, thinking about, you know, what your experience is, what your knowledge is, what do you think bisexual people need in terms of advocacy, resources, community? Like what, what would you like to see uh, change or better um, for bisexual people? That is the hundred million dollar question, right? I mean, I... <laughs> I think recognition, right? Always representation and recognition. And so this is, this speaks to the importance of representation in the media and healthy representation, let me be clear, right? Not representation in movies and shows that relies on old and tired stereotypes of bisexuality. Representation is huge for all marginalized communities. And that really needs to look like the diversity of the bi plus community, right? And so not just by white cisgender people. Um, it really needs to reflect the diversity of our community. And I think that that's huge. I would say from kind of the more academic and research side of my life, funding, right? Funding to do the work that we do at the national federal level, there needs to be funding to do this work. Otherwise we're just sort of piecing together the research and trying to carve out time, oftentimes in the midst of full-time jobs elsewhere to do this research, publish this research and pay research participants who deserve to be paid for the work that they're doing. Um, and so funding at a national level um, from the NIH, from other federal level sponsors would go a long way here in helping us to better understand the needs of this community and to overcome the health disparities that the Bi Plus community really faces, which is well documented at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Like we have, we have every reason to think that there should be funding and to see the, the, 
the need and, and the benefits that can come from that, because we've seen that happen with other communities. Um, and, and it really does push things forward in terms of research and then in terms of meeting those needs that are identified. So fantastic. Um, anything else you want, you want people to know about bisexuality or about your work? No, I'm, I'm so pleased that you're doing this and thank you for all of the work that you have done. I would be remiss if I didn't say that in our time together today. So you have paved the way for the work that I do and for so many others. So thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. That's so nice. I, I, I feel like we're all in this together. And one, you know, one of the things that's been most rewarding to me about being a bisexual person engaged in bisexual research and advocacy is getting to connect with all the other bisexual people who are involved in research and advocacy. It's, it's, uh, it's really been a delightful journey in that way of connection and, and collaboration. I, I love that we got to collaborate. You know, we co-edited a special issue of um, the Journal of Sex and Relationship Therapy on bisexuality and relationships. And I, I gained so much from that and appreciated so much getting to work with you on that. Me too, what a fun project. I know. Um, I don't know if there are ways that you want people to follow or connect with you, but uh, I'll give you yeah. an opportunity to share, yeah. Yeah, so I am I am not a social media guru, but I do have a professional Instagram page at Dr. Jennifer Bensel um, on Instagram. And I have not yet been able to be convinced by my colleagues to get on Twitter yet. So you'll have to find me on Instagram for now. Okay, great. You know what? That's fine. I feel like that's 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 where people are headed. People just want to look at pictures. They don't even want to read, you know, 280 characters these days. <laughs> yeah, I love the format of Instagram. So I, I feel like I'm staying there for now. Um, technically, I have a TikTok, but it's nothing's happening there. So. <laughs> All right. Well, fantastic. Well, now you'll have this piece up on YouTube also, and people will be able to hear from you directly this way. Thank you so much. It's, it's just wonderful to have your insights um, based on your research, based on your experience as a therapist, and uh, yeah, just appreciate so much the work that you do. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. It was great to talk with you.